a production of the New Jersey Courts. So you graduated uh, from college in 1963, mm -hmm. and you went uh, right to Rutgers Law School, uh, then the Newark campus. Yep. Why Rutgers? Um, it was a great school. It was close. I was going to stay home, which I did. I lived at home. Um, and uh, it was really, really inexpensive. <laughs> Seriously inexpensive. So, um, and my parents have been paying tuition for private school since I was like in, a freshman in high school, all through college. So, it, this seemed like a, especially because of the reputation of the school, it just seemed like a great idea. Now, um, tell me a little bit about that first year, which always seems particularly challenging. Well, I'll tell you the first thing. The difference between all those nuns that I had been with all those years, first day of law school, then a huge classroom full of people, professor comes in and I leap to my feet because that is what you did when the professor came in, in all the schools that I ever attended. And I was the only person standing up. And I was looking at him and he was looking at me. He wondered if I had something that I wanted to tell him and I never did it again. <laughs> yeah. Do any, uh, any of those professors early on stand out in your memory? Well, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Sure. She was my civil prof uh, procedure uh, professor. Um, we had great teachers. Our, um, Professor Cowan, who taught us torts, was like being in a, a movie theater m from the beginning until the end. You were transfixed. Arthur Kanoy, who was one of the great civil rights um, lawyers, would argue cases in the Supreme Court one day and come in and talk to us about the case the next day. Uh, Saul Mendlevitz, Law and World Order, kind of got us used to the idea that we need to be looking outside of our borders um, as, as time goes by, and we see that now even more so. They, I had absolutely amazing professors. Mm. Well, I'm curious, uh, since Ruth Bader Ginsburg obviously went on to the Supreme Court, any memories in particular of her and her influence? No, she was, very, she was a very quiet, um, kind of low-key professor, and civil procedure is not exactly a laugh a minute, I, I, I must tell you. Mm -hmm. No matter who taught it, it was going to be, you, it is basically the underpinning for everything that happens in the law, but you're looking at all the forms, um, uh, remedies, it's pretty dry stuff. So she did as well as could be done with it, but it wasn't, you know, a knee slapper. Mm. So. In your three years there, would you say it was still a pretty traditional curriculum, um, or were they starting to move into more of the social justice aspects? Well, in my I, Arthur Kanoy probably changed things to some extent because he and William Kunstler both taught at the school, and there were um, civil rights um, matters that were were taught. So I think it was on the move, maybe, but it was still a pretty traditional place. The men wore jackets and ties, and we wore dresses and heels to law school. Well, if you went over there today, you would not be seeing that, I can assure you. Mm. How many women were in your class? Um, we had the breakthrough class. Twelve women started, four women finished. Mm. Um, I've heard from uh, other law students from this era that at some schools they would have a women's day where they would have the, the women uh, in the class go on stage and answer questions from everybody? That, no. Did that ever no, happen? but I know that um, there were women ahead of me. For example, I, I remember Judge Loftus, she was alone in her class, that she would have been about four years ahead of me. Um, she was called on every single time. Hmm. That is what, and um, professors like to do that. Do you think there was uh, any any additional prejudice towards uh, the female students? 
it wasn't really prejudice. I mean, professors said to us, it was really fun. The people that I met there, I'm still friendly with, so it's not a big, wasn't a big deal. But there were a number of people, professors and students, who said, you should not be here taking the place of a man who is going to be a breadwinner because you're not going to keep on working. Mm. So uh, that was there. Mm -hmm. um, what, any other classes that stand out in your memory as being something that influenced you later or, you know, affected your, your uh, thoughts about your career path? No, I don't think so. Uh, I, I actually did like the administrative law, and then I ultimately went to the AG's sure. office, so that was probably a little bit a part of the attraction. Hmm. And did you get involved in any activities like law review, that sort of thing? Yes, I was. In those days, you had to um, be in a certain percentage in your class, top 10 percent, top something. I don't know what it was. And then you would be invited to compete for a law review, which I was, but then I went into the moot court competition, mm. and this sounds braggy, I know, but I won that, and so I became the captain of the moot court team, so I dropped out of law review and did that instead. Mm. Busy. Right. What, what did you find most interesting about moot court? Um, arguing. I loved being on my feet, and mm. I loved the brief writing. And that, I have loved it for an entire career, for 50-some years, m making the arguments. I just loved it. Hmm. Um, what did you do in the summers in between? Um, after my first year, I, I clerked in a large law firm in Plainfield, McDonough and Sullivan, um, private law firm. And the second year, I clerked in the AG's office. And that's what set me on my career path because I loved it. Mm. What were you doing that summer in the AG's office? Just, I was writing memos on various, um, you know, legal issues involving state uh, matters, and I just liked it very much, and I liked that kind of, that collegial atmosphere among the, um, the lawyers. Mm. Um, let's see, any other memories of uh, law school that, that stand out that you want to share? No, oh, I made friends in law school who are still my best friends today. The first day of law school, I borrowed money for the coffee machine. I didn't have the right change from the woman sitting next to me. And, um, you know, we were in each other's weddings. Her son clerked for me on the Supreme Court, and we are as close today as we were then. That's 50-some years later. Wow. So. Um, so you graduated in 1966. Yep. Um, you talked about how there was this... Um, notion that women shouldn't be in the field, taking the place of a man, that sort mm -hmm. of thing. I would imagine that would be amplified in the actual job search. It was. Uh, we couldn't get, uh, most women could not get clerkships. The judges came right out and said my wife would not like it if I were working, you know, closely with a woman. Uh, private law firms were pretty much foreclosed. Uh, I think we talked the other day. There was an article in the um, Wall Street Journal, it was in 63, and basically it came right out and said, women are the least wanted associates in any law firm on any subject, regardless of their, uh, their status in law school, how they did, just not wanted. Hmm. So it was not a very welcoming atmosphere. Hmm. And you also mentioned there were a lot of gender politics related to appearance and that sort of thing oh. when you would go out on the well, when uh, job I, hunter. You, or when you well, when you finally got a job, you assume you finally got a job. <laughs> it was just part of the territory. Everybody commented on what you were wearing, how you looked, said that you were pretty. My first, I was sworn in on November 1st, 1966. On November 2nd, I had to go down to Monmouth County uh, to do some appeals from uh, DWI cases. I had four of them. My adversary was a great DWI lawyer. He was well-known and a very nice man. He called me through the entire four cases, um, the beautiful deputy attorney general, the lovely deputy attorney general, the adorable deputy attorney general, mm -hmm. and he would say things like, now, there's a way that the adorable Deputy Attorney General can get that evidence in, but she's not doing it right. So what he was doing was, first of all, it was kind of embarrassing to be called that, but he, would, he was objecting 
to my question, but get, not giving me any information as to what I was doing wrong, and I didn't really know that much about courtroom procedure at the time. Mm. I have to tell you, I was in tears mm. during that, that day from all perspectives. Mm. But I got a tougher skin as time went on. I went up to Union County, um, stood up, and the adversary said, I object to her being here. And the judge said, why? He said, I don't know, but this cannot be right. Wow. Judge said to my friend, every t in open court in front of a jury, every time I look at you, I think of Shirley Temple on the good ship Lollipop. Hmm. And those are just anecdotes, but everybody, everybody experienced them, and I know that because I knew everybody who was a, a woman lawyer at that time. There were so few of us. Hmm. I, uh, well, I want, I want to come back to that, but yeah. um, we skipped over the bar uh, exam. T tell me a little bit about that. Oh. Well, it was, it was grueling. That's the only way I can describe it. It was, we had the bar review courses, and um, I roomed with two other women who actually became judges as well later on, Judy Eskin and Miriam Spann. And, um, I, I still had dreams about failing the bar long after I had passed it, if you can imagine mm. that. It was such a traumatic experience because everything that I, we had done for all those three years was, was riding on that day. And then we had skills and methods, which they don't have anymore, but that was, uh, it, was a, it was a tough summer. Mm. What was skills and methods? It was, um, it was just a practice um, series you had to do after you... I uh, took the bar, which is uh, like at the end of July. Then in August, you would uh, they would teach you how to go about doing various um, tasks in the law, procedural stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so you get into uh, you, you're uh, sworn into the bar. Um, I'm, I'm thinking of a story that Justice Coleman told, how when he was sworn in, you had to go sign the book. I don't know if that was still the case, yep. but but you, you could see, in his case, he could see how few African-American oh. lawyers there were. Was it the same regarding Abs women? Oh, absolutely the same. You, everybody had, each person got to walk across the stage in the War Memorial Building. Um, and that, you could see, I mean, I can tell you there were five, four or five women in, in that uh, group. Mm -hmm. I mean, most of them were my classmates, or the four women that I graduated with. And then I can remember maybe two or three others, maybe five or six in all. Hmm. So uh, your first job uh, was with the uh, Attorney, AG's. Yeah. Um, tell me about uh, getting that and what your initial assignments were. Okay. It was, um, my salary was $5,500 a year, and um, a man in my law school class who didn't do as well as I did got $6,500 a year because he had a family and I didn't, and that was just the way it was. Um, my first assignment was, um, I think I was, I'm not sure what was exactly the first. I think it was the Department of Education for a little period of time. Then I was in the criminal investigation section. Um, I did, um, I represented um, the Department of Banking and Insurance over time, and that's where I met Justice Clifford, because he was the Commissioner of Banking at the time. Um, I did work on various legislation, and that's where I met um, Justice Pierre Garvin, Chief Justice Pierre Garvin, because uh, he was Governor's Counsel to um, uh, Governor Cahill at the mm -hmm. time. And I was Counsel to Institutions and Agencies. I, you know, did a lot. But you've got to remember, the expansiveness of these assignments. There were 50 deputy attorneys general for everything. Hmm. There are like 500 now. Hmm. So, I mean, if you were to say to a deputy attorney general today, well, you're going to be representing education, higher education, and the Department of Institutions and Agency, they'd quit because <laughs> it would be just way too much work. Hmm. Um, but, and in addition to all that, we represented the state police in all DWI cases and radar cases everywhere in the state of New Jersey. Mm -hmm. So we had to 
uh, divvy up among the young deputies, because they're the ones who did it, the night trial work, which we did as well. So it was, it was pretty, it was a lot of work, but it was really fun. Hmm. Now, um, early on, yeah, this would have been during, I guess, the Hughes administration? Yeah. Uh, you know, in that first year, there was the North riots, the Plainfield riots. Oh. Did those affect your well, yeah. experience at all? I was sent with another deputy attorney general to Newark to work in um, the Essex County Prosecutor's Office to help them try the riot cases because they were short-handed. And that's where I met Brendan Byrne, mm -hmm. who ultimately appointed me to everything. Uh, any memories of that, that period? Well, it was kind of anxiety producing. I had never tried a jury, I'd never been before a jury, and I had to learn on my feet pretty much. So, take that train to Newark every morning, and they'd just hand me a file, and I'd go to a courtroom and pick a jury. It was, it was wonderful experience. Hmm. Uh, I'm not saying I was Clarence Darrow, but it was a great experience. Well, again, you you did a variety of jobs, but um, I was wondering if maybe we could try to find uh, an example from some of these different areas. Like, is there a particular case when you were working in education that, that stands out? Oh, yes. The Netcong school prayer case. The Board of Education of Netcong, despite what the United States Supreme Court had said, instituted a voluntary moment of school prayer, um, and they used the, the prayer from the congressional record, and they instituted in their, um, in their school system. And the Attorney General um, and the Commissioner of Education, Carl Marburger, sued them um, under the Establishment Clause and said, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. And it was a very, very dramatic set of proceedings. I had to have a state policeman pick me up in the morning and stay with me at all times because of the tempers that were running extremely, extremely high um, uh, there. And um, it was it was a little bit scary at times. They, they were sending out leaflets um, in which they referred to me as the mini-skirted deputy attorney general, which mm. wasn't really true, but that's what they said. But they also said, and it would tell you the tenor of the times, they said, I was Jewish, Attorney General Sills was Jewish, and Carl Marburger, the commissioner of education, was Jewish, and that was why we were doing this. Mm -hmm. That was the, when I say the feelings ran high, they ran extremely high. Would you get calls at home or? Yep. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So. So, um, what about uh, when you went to the, the criminal investigations? Any, uh, you must have been dealing with a lot of cases there that were memorable. No, but, not yeah. really. I mean, honestly, most of what we did was respond to complaints um, that were being filed about. Uh, officials or what have you um, by citizens. We didn't, uh, I, mostly what I did in criminal was write, prepare a, a handbook, complete handbook for the state police and for local police on um, search and seizure. I did it with another deputy attorney general and we spent most of our time on that during that period. Hmm. The upshot of that was that we were both supposed to teach at the police training commission, but I was not permitted to do so because they said the policemen would not like that. Hmm. So. Wow. So it's interesting how often this uh, Reared prejudice its comes ugly up. head, yeah. right? Wow. Um, and then you went into uh, banking and insurance, which was that your longest tenure uh, assignment longest assignment yeah. no no because then I after that I became the deputy assistant attorney general in charge of appeals so then I was doing you know reviewing briefs and doing arguing and writing briefs in every single area so mm -hmm. um, what year did you become the de deputy attorney assistant, general for, assistant? Um, I'm gonna yeah. say so I got there in 66 I would say maybe 70 okay so I did that for a couple of years. 
uh, and any of those appeal cases uh, stand out? No, not, you know, not really. Um, it was just arguing cases in the Supreme Court and the appellate division on a, you know, monthly basis, which is some, most lawyers don't get to the Supreme Court ever mm -hmm. in their careers. It was just an extraordinary um, experience, that's all mm. I can tell you. And the Supreme Court is still frozen in my memory, despite the fact that I've been on, was on the Supreme mm. Court myself. It is that Supreme Court with Justice, Chief Justice Weintraub. When somebody uh, says Supreme Court, that's the Supreme Court that I think <laughs> of. Well, it's curious, uh, you know, what did you learn as a, a lawyer appearing before the Supreme Court about how it operates? Well, I was just, I mean, it, both the appellate division and the Supreme Court were unbelievably impressive in their, um, obviously in their writings, but in their performance on the bench. They knew the cases. They were, it's called a hot court. Mm -hmm. they, they knew what questions to ask, and you needed to be really ready. You needed to be on your toes with them. Mm -hmm. So then um, in 1973, you uh, briefly went into private practice. Right. Uh, why, why make that move then? Um, I just thought it was, I w it was time for a change, basically. I wanted to see what private practice was like. Um, as it turned out, it was a wonderful firm. They were wonderful people, but it just was not for me. I really loved the public sector. And during that time, were you uh, appearing in court, representing clients, or doing other kinds of law? Um, I was mostly carrying someone else's bag. <laughs> right. oh. Wow. Did a, I, I did some writing, but basically, um, in a private law firm, you are not going to get. I came from the, the top where I was arguing in the Supreme Court and the appellate division every other week. And then in a private law firm, that is never going to happen. Mm -hmm. So, Was there a gender element to that? No, or? I no. don't think so. I think all the associates were pretty much doing the same thing. Okay. And then you went back into the Department of Consumer Affairs yes. in 1975. Yep. And what were you doing there? Well, at Consumer Affairs, we were, this was the heyday of the consumer movement because mm -hmm. um, states were starting to enact um, consumer laws. Every TV network had a consumer affairs person, Betty Furness. Um, and, but in addition, the department uh, had, uh, was in charge of all the professional boards, which would be, you know, medical board, dental, etc. So it was a pretty um, heavy responsibility. Mm -hmm. Pretty interesting, too. I did a lot of TV and um, radio spots during that period of time, so it was, uh, it was kind of fun. Mm. And I would imagine less appearances in court? or Oh, none, none because I, no, no. I had a lawyer for me. I oh. mean, there was a lawyer assigned to the agency. I was just an administrative person there. Mm. And then you went into the Department of Banking. Banking, and yes, that's right. I became the commissioner. Um, and uh, I was there for about a year, and Governor Burns' counsel, who was Jerry English, uh, called me in and asked if I was interested in becoming a Superior Court judge. Well, was I interested? Of course I was interested. That was always what I w wanted to do, and so the rest is history. Hmm. Any memories about your time as Commissioner of Banking that stand out? Um, not, not really. I mean, I did uh, bank applications for branches, those kinds of things. There was no um, major um, initiative other than we were looking into redlining <coughs> um, at that point. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, Had it been um, a priority before then? No, it had not. Okay. Yeah, but the governor was interested in what was happening there, and we were doing um, some investigations on that score. Mm. So would it mostly be cracking down on uh, people using that practice uh, or, or um, trying to develop policy? Or, well, that or was the intention, was to, to try and end that policy so that inner city people would not be redlined out of the possibility of getting mortgages. Mm -hmm. and. Um, uh, I know that the governor did work on that after, and, and the subsequent commissioners did work on that. Mm -hmm. 
So tell me about the transition to the bench. Uh, you know, you you go on the Superior Court. Where where were you first assigned? That sort of thing. Well, let me tell you something. Before that, I went before the State Bar Committee, and they asked me if I was having any more children, mm -hmm. and who was going to take care of them if I was going to become a judge. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it what we talked about before pervaded everything. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if I should say this, but I will. So when they said, was I having any more children? I said, no, even though I was five months pregnant. And so I've always wondered over these years if that was going to come back to haunt me, but it hasn't. Mm. Um, what about those first few weeks and months getting into this new, new role? Well, it was, it was different, but one of the things that was interesting to me was that court attendants, court clerks, went to the assignment judge and said, do not put me in that courtroom because I could never work for a woman. Never. Hmm. So they had to beat the bushes to get somebody who was, was willing to come. Hmm. So, but uh, honestly, I loved every second of being a trial judge. Every assignment that I had, criminal, civil, family, there wasn't one day that I didn't just love. Mm. So did they have a method for preparing you or was it just based on your own experience? Well, no, <laughs> that was the problem. It's much more organized now than it was then. Then there was a, like, it was called baby judges school once a year. If you didn't hit that just right, you might be appointed, which I was, say in March, mm -hmm. and not get to baby judges school until August. So up to that point, you're pretty much on your own. But let me tell you how collegial these judges were. My first assignment, whatever it was, to matrimonial, the matrimonial judge had me to his house um, to spend the day on Sunday before Monday to go over everything. Mm. Moved to um, criminal, two criminal judges had me over to spend the day and just go through everything so I wouldn't be walking in blind. And mm -hmm. then we sat, what we did, the fir when you're first uh, appointed, uh, you sit with another judge. And so I sat in civil with Harry Osborne, I sat in matrimonial with uh, Bill Dreyer, um, and I sat in uh, criminal with Warren Brody. Mm -hmm. and, and that was a way to kind of get your feet wet. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, it was, juries still were like aghast at the sight of me. That's the only way I could describe it. I, even though they were on television, there were women judges on TV at that time, I would walk out into that courtroom and it would be <gasps> like that. Wow. So. And you, you mentioned uh, when we talked on Friday that at that point they were saying there would only be one female oh, judge. Oh, oh, right. Vic that, yeah, there, it, the belief was during that period of time that there would be only one woman anything in any particular location. So if there was going to be a woman partner in a law firm, that was the end of it for everybody else. If there was a woman judge in a vicinage, it was believed that would be the end of it for everybody else. And so actually in one instance where there were two very qualified women in a county, one of them just moved to a different county when the first one was appointed to the bench wow. because that was, that was the way it seemed it was going to unfurl. And you know, I wish I could say to you, we stood up to this scourge and we fought it, but that wouldn't be the truth. What we did was we took it as just part of the territory and we just faced it and we just outworked everybody else because we knew that we were gonna cast a long shadow on anybody who came after us, how we did the first woman commissioners, the first women judges, how we did was gonna matter to the future of all the women who were behind us. So that's how we did it. Hmm. Um, were there either formal or informal networks of, of uh, either on the, the, the bench or before when you were a lawyer or uh, you know in the government? I know, wouldn't kinda, call it a network. Yeah. It's just that there were so few of us, we all knew each other, we met for lunch, or we'd meet for dinner. Um, and if you call that a network, that's what it was. But you know, and the other thing is this, 
No other mothers, for example, in the schools that my children went to worked. Mm. And I and all the other women that I knew who worked felt compelled not to let their children wear bought Halloween costumes and not to bring Dunkin' Donuts to Teacher Appreciation Day. We felt compelled to bake everything from scratch just to show that we could stack up mm. with the stay-at-home mothers, which was, I, I guess, a self-imposed uh, issue, but it was, I do not even know how we did all that we did. That's all I can say. Where were you uh, living at this time? Westfield, because okay. I was um, in Union County at the time. Hmm. So, um, and you, uh, by the time you were on the bench, you had uh, at least one child? Or, well, we had know? adopted two children in November of 1977, and I had another baby in um, July of 1978. Mm -hmm. So we had a full house quickly. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, now, we talked about um, uh, the growing role of women in the legal profession. Um, what about uh, um, people of color, particularly women of color? Like, when, when do you remember, like, the first maybe African-American or another uh, person of color uh, on the bench in trying, your area? I'm trying to even remember who were the first ones would have been. Maybe a Shirley Tolentino. Uh, Renee Jones Weeks. These were women I knew from the Attorney General's office and they were just behind me, but they were, I think, the first women on the bench. But every, every study, um, even today, about women still not being treated uh, equally in the profession say that women of color are worse off still than white women. Mm -hmm. So it's been a continuing issue. Tell me a little bit about um, uh, presiding over some some cases. Maybe an example. You don't have to give names, but what you know experiences you remember uh, from being having your own courtroom now. Well, the experiences are like more generic than a particular case. I I found, for example, a criminal trial where the actual details of the crime are being testified to. Policemen running after suspects, jumping over fences. I found those utterly fascinating, mm -hmm. even though they were the same crime over and over again. Just that, that element of, it was almost like the, uh, a, a camera, a movie camera mm -hmm. uh, that was, was showing the details. Family law, if you ever want to experience the human condition, you become a judge in a family court. You've got them at the point at which all of those dreams, all of those backlit silhouettes in the, in the wedding photographs have been dashed. Mm -hmm. And the only true love that they will ever have in their lives, the love they have for their children, is at issue sometimes. You get the people at their worst, and it is just, um, a, just a fascinating slice of life is the only way to describe it. Mm -hmm. that, so those, that, that was those two assignments. And civil, you're looking at... Um, negligence cases, malpractice cases, they're just fascinating in themselves. Mm -hmm. There was not a day that I did not love being a trial court judge. And I sat in Union, I sat in Middlesex during that period, I sat in Monmouth, and I was the commitment judge at Marlboro Psychiatric Hospital, which um, goes to the lowest judge on the totem pole. I loved that assignment too. Mm -hmm. I met the most interesting people, the patients were really interesting. So how would that go? Um, would would they, they usually have a, a lawyer? Yes, they have a lawyer. A doctor is, te the doctor will testify as to the condition of the patient. The patient can speak and the patient is also represented by counsel. And these are like periodic reviews. Mm -hmm. Anybody who is involuntarily committed to a psychiatric hospital, or at least then, had to have a periodic review. Um, in the first uh, maybe period, maybe every three, then six months, and then if they're there longer, probably every year. And so that is what I did. Mm -hmm. Now, nobody wanted that assignment, but I am telling you, it was really, really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. So 
in nineteen in the eighties, I think nineteen eighty six was when you moved up to the appellate court. Level? No, in eighty three, I left Union County and went to become the Chancery Judge for Mercer, Somerset, and Hunterdon. Okay. There'd never been now the Chancery assignment. It was then and still is the plum assignment. There'd never been a woman who was a Chancery Judge before, so that was something that was new and unusual. And that was so interesting uh, for a lot of different reasons. It was Mercer, so all the state cases came there. The first day that I arrived was a case about whether or not Judge Pressler's um, uh, Judiciary Committee hearing for her re-up re on her um, after seven years, whether that could be held in camera or not, quietly. That's what they wanted to do. So right from the get-go, it was exciting, but the interesting part of the chancery assignment is people think of this as, oh, big business. And it's, it's also sisters and brothers fighting over their mother's jewelry. Mm. It's people fighting over their driveways because chancery is, is the court in which people are not there for, mon you know, for money damages. They're there for other kinds of relief like injunctions or, or mandamus. So, um, those were interesting, and I also had all the cases involving um, Jehovah's Witnesses who would not allow um, their children to receive blood transfusions, and then the hospital would come in, and I'd have to make that decision. Um, I had a couple of cases. I had two cases where a patient had gangrene and was refusing um, amputation. Mm. Um, I had to go to the hospital and observed patient was saying he didn't have gangrene. Mm. And they were just fascinating. That's all I can say. Yeah. I was only there a year though. I um, then went to the appellate division in 84. Mm. So by this time in the uh, early to mid 80s, were attitudes changing much mm -hmm. towards uh, the role of women in the bar? I think so. I think in 83, the Committee on Women in the Courts was established by Chief Justice Wilentz. He said, look and see how women are being treated in the judicial system by all the players. I was on that committee, um, and we made a report at the Judicial College in 1984 and said they're not being treated that well hmm. because that was what we got back. All the surveys that we got back said the same thing, that they're called by their first names, Judges make comments about their looks, their clothing. Still, this was now in 83, mm. um, that there was an atmosphere of, you know, I, one, I remember one woman responded in the survey, said, um, I expected them to pass out the brandy and cigars. When we got into chambers, they were talking about their golf game and when they were going to see each other on Saturday at the tennis matches. Um, and I have to say, when we made that, re and. But the interesting part about that is that women respondents responded completely differently than male respondents. Male said, nothing's going on, nothing's wrong, everything's fine, don't worry about it. There is nothing to even talk about, mm -hmm. uh, whereas the women reported what I, I just said. So we made this report, and we went around to various bar associations before the Judicial College to tell them the re results of the surveys. Now, I did not have this happen to me, but one of the judges who went there had rolls thrown at her. Wow. People were booing and hissing because they thought the idea that there was differential treatment of women was a bunch of baloney. Mm -hmm. So the Chief Justice put us on the program at the Judicial College, and the judges were really up in arms. They didn't think either. They didn't think there was a problem either. And they were threatening to boycott, but the chief said anybody who doesn't show up at that meeting will have to answer to me. And the place was jammed. So we gave our report, and after that, things actually did start to change. And that committee is still in effect today mm -hmm. and is still working in a lot of respects today about the problem of women of color. Mm -hmm. So, because it seems like a lot has changed. No, it doesn't just seem like it. Much has changed. Women are really fully integrated into the practice at this point. Mm. Um, so, that was 
wow. our venture into the world of sociology. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, uh, Chief Justice Wilentz really uh, seemed to tackle these, these issues yep. uh, during his tenure. Um, uh, I want to ask about your other um, committee committee work. Uh, you were on a lot of the yeah. Supreme Court committees. Yep. And we maybe won't get into everyone, um, but uh, I also wanted to ask about your um, reflections on Chief Justices you had contact with before you joined the court. Well, Pierre Garvin. Well, Pierre Garvin was a complete and utter gentleman. That's all that I can say about him. I knew Chief Justice Hughes. You know from mutual friends, he was a prince. That's the only way I can say. I never sat with either of them as a chief. Chief Justice Wilentz was my chief justice during my entire tenure. I was respected him more than I could even tell you the way that he, he ran the judicial system. The justices that I actually sat with were um, Chief Justice Poritz, Chief Justice Zazali um, and Chief Justice Rabner. But every Chief Justice is different. Um, the, they used to say that Chief Justice Vanderbilt was a team player, but only if he could be captain. And they also said that Chief Justice Wilentz was never pushy, but he could keep a conversation going until you came around to his point of view <laughs> if it took all night. But the chiefs that I sat with were not like that at all. Chief Justice Poritz, um, they were just, comp they recognized that they were one of many. And they, um, they were so collegial, I cannot even tell you. She, what she tried to do, and I think the other justices who followed her followed suit, was to try and um, emery board off the outer edges of every argument hmm. and tried to look for common ground. And that is how she, she ran um, the Supreme Court. And that's how the uh, Chief Justice Azali, the most collegial person that you can meet, except for Chief Justice Rabner. These are people who um, understand how a collegial body has to operate. Hmm. Um. I'm curious, from your perspective then, as a member of the Superior Court and then the Appellate Division, um, there's obviously a lot of traditions and standards inherent in this court system. How are those, I guess, transmitted to the rank and file of the, the bench from, say, a figure like, like Wilentz or, or just from the past? Uh, what, how does the institutional uh, practices and culture get soaked in? Well, the actual practices are just taught as you, you know, become, well, I told you what happened in the trial court, how the judges would try and help you just understand what you should be doing in your assignment. Mm -hmm. The appellate division, the appellate division judges themselves would train the newbies as to the way things were to proceed. But in terms of um, attitude, whatever you want to call it, it always has to come from the top. And with Chief Justice Wilentz and with those who have followed him, the idea of judicial independence, always acting in an independent way, not having any um, uh, discussions or uh, about cases, not allowing politics to enter at all, that is repeated and repeated and repeated enough that I think it is internalized by the judges. Mm -hmm. But again, as far as process or procedure, when you get onto a court, when you're assigned, you become an appellate division judge, you learn by doing. Mm -hmm. And I think you've heard from other justices uh, who sat on the appellate division that it's very different from the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. um, the process there is to we would get the cases uh, weeks in advance, read them, exchange memos about them saying, um, I, I agree with what the trial judge did, I disagree, I'm on the fence on this, let's discuss it. We would then discuss it again the morning of the, um, the argument. We then would have argument and then we would decide the case on the spot. Supreme Court is not at all like that. It is a ritualized, methodology that was put in place by um, Chief Justice Vanderbilt. 
The cases are never discussed in advance so that we would have open minds during oral argument. They are not even discussed on the day of oral argument after the argument. The, the thought was that there should be a week of rumination or reflection, and then we would come back a week later, and um, the chief would call on somebody to recite, and then we would vote. Um, but as I say, no interrupting. I mean, totally different. The appellate division was like sitting around discussing important issues of the day with your friends over coffee and donuts. This was different from that. And the no interrupting part, very hard for me. <laughs> you, no matter what any justice said, no matter what that person said, if you had disagreed with that justice, including and and the, it's still, you couldn't interrupt. And that, I'm, it really is a very civilized way of operating, I must say. Mm. So, but you know, when I was, um, I took Justice Handler's seat. And so I read a retrospective of his career when I was coming up. And it said he had written 240 opinions in 20 years on the bench. I said, man, this is going to be easy because I wrote like 2,500 opinions in my 15 years on the appellate division. I just had no idea at all about the intensity of the work mm. on the court. And um, between cert petitions, the actual appeals, rulemaking, Discipline, lawyer discipline, it, it was a 24-7 job. And I can only say that the spouses of the justices are the saints in all of this. Hmm. When I say 24-7, I mean that I never had a day that I didn't work, including on a cruise ship um, where I was emailing back and forth to my law clerk um, versions uh, of an opinion that I was writing. I never drove anywhere with my husband without a box of cert petitions at my feet. So I could, there could never be any downtime in this job. And the people, the wives and husbands of the justices all deserve the gold star because they're mm. the people who had to put up with this over all these years. Mm.